Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk called Created to be Creative. Um, this is a talk that has been taken from a course that my husband and I have written called Origins Onwards. And as it says on the slide, you can see in front of you, this is all about the creator God and how we have been created to be creative and how we are set apart from the animal kingdom and a little bit of science is involved as well at some point. But nothing too difficult because I wouldn't be able to explain it if it was. So we'll begin. The Bible tells us in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now he did this in six days. The creation was devoid of blemish, defect, disease, suffering, death and sin. It was perfect and God looked at it at the end of the sixth day and said, this is very good. He was very pleased with what he had created and spoken into being. We have in the, on day three, all the plants were created, which um, as you can see, there's just a small, very, very small selection of the myriad of colors and shapes that we can find in the plant world. And these are just flowers that I find very, very pretty. But let's look at one plant in particular, the Venus flytrap. This weird and wonderful plant knows to open its jaws or leaves and wait for an insect to land upon it. When an insect crawling along the leaves contacts a tiny hair on the surface, the trap's timing mechanism is activated. But the trap does not close straight away. Only when a second hair is contacted within 20 seconds of the first contact, then and only then is the trap triggered. The jaws, so to speak, shut and the plant eats the insect. Now the second trigger serves as a safeguard against a waste of energy in trapping objects with no nutritional value, because otherwise a bit of dust could be flying along and it would trap, keep trapping everything. So not only does the Venus flytrap know how to trap flies, it also knows how not to be fooled by a false alarm. Even a man-made mouse trap can't do that. Something that we design as human beings can't even put that thinking into a mouse trap. So the Venus fry trap can say we can safely say was designed by the author of creativity himself. And then on day five we had the animals and then we've got some birds here and the animals and some sea creatures and uh, so we're looking at those sorry the birds and the sea creatures this time. I jumped ahead a bit. And here you can see, again, a myriad of um, variety with beautiful colours on the kingfishers, the parrot. The, there's, you know, there's so much variety and diversity in just these, these two groups, the sea creatures and the flying creatures. So here's a very unusual one, the mimic octopus. Now, the mimic octopus is a camouflage-capable, shape-shifting creature that can contort its body and colour to mimic the appearance of 15 other organisms. This ability is used to catch prey or to frighten off a predator by changing into the predator's own predator. For example, scientists observed that when the mimic octopus is attacked by a damselfish, it mimics the banded sea snake, which is a known predator of the damselfish. This weird and wonderful creature has been designed to discern which dangerous sea creature to impersonate for each occasion. And there are some pictures of what it can turn into. A snail, even at the bottom, uh, like a piece of seaweed. That is actually the mimic octopus. Quite incredible, isn't it? And then on day six, we have the land animals that uh, were formed. And here we have baby ones, because they are really lovely to look at as you can see, and really cute. Um, and then finally was the pinnacle of creation, which was man followed by woman. And here's an unusual uh, creature as well, the monarch butterfly. If you planned to go somewhere you had never been before, you would need to have a map or a guide. 
Consider then the amazing journey of the monarch butterfly. In the spring, female monarchs fly about 1,500 kilometers from southern USA to northern USA and Canada. There they lay their eggs and die. The caterpillars hatch out, feed, go into the chrysalis stage and finally emerge as butterflies. In the autumn, these young butterflies gather in huge flocks, then they begin flying south, heading for the places where their mothers came from in the spring. Without maps or guides or parental guidance, they find their way back to the monarch's winter home in California, Florida or Mexico. The monarch's ability to fly such great distances to places they have never been to before at the right time of year could not have evolved but must have been designed or programmed into them. That it really is quite incredible if you think about it and to even know where to go. So as that flies away, and then we have um, the heavens and earth, um, we, God created all of it. And here are some pictures of the heavens, just some that we're now able to see through um, our technology with the Hubble telescope. Just beautiful, isn't it? So if God is the creator of the universe, he is also the creator of time itself. He is not limited by the dimension of time that he created. He has no beginning in time and no end in time. Scientists now know the universe is finite and that it had a beginning. Now everything that has a beginning must have a cause greater than itself to start it off and something that didn't need to be created. Otherwise you get into the thing of who created the thing that got created, who created the God, who created, who created and so on. So time is a physical entity with a beginning. Every aspect of our 24 seven world is governed by a clock. As humans, we live by the clock. All the clocks that make our lives tick from the alarm clock that wakes us up in the morning to the thermostat that warms our homes, along with every little gadget man has designed. They all depend on internal clocks. Have you ever woken up just before your alarm clock went off and wondered if your body is wired with some sort of internal clock? Well, it is. And scientists have discovered millions of clocks in the human body with more still to be found. Now scientists are discovering that we are not the only ones run by clocks. The whole living world has built in clocks to keep its systems on schedule, from humans and animals to plants and single cells. Even at the chromosome level, genes are turned off and on by sophisticated clocks. Now this dependence on the 24 hour cycle of night and day should not surprise us. Genesis's account of creation emphasizes that this cycle began on day one when God said, let there be light, and he separated the light from the darkness, calling the light day and the darkness night. There was evening and there was morning, the first day. Since ancient times, human beings have recognized that our lives sync with this cycle as we grow tired or hungry at predictable times. But it wasn't until a few decades ago that scientists began exploring how our body systems are specifically designed at a molecular level to interface with the cycle of light and dark. And this special system is called a circadian rhythm clock. So as you can see, we have our deepest sleep at certain times, two o'clock in the morning, apparently. Um, and as you go around that chart, I'll just give you time to have a little read over it. It's showing you that our bodies do certain things when it's dark and other things when it's light. So it is very much linked to this 24 hour um, day with 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness. Increasing interest in this clock in the 1960s opened a whole new field of biology known as chronology, which is the timing of biological activity. In recognition of major research advances in this field, the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was awarded to three scientists who discovered the molecular mechanisms controlling the circadian rhythm. Very, very clever people, I add. 
So this field of research continues to revolutionize how we understand all of life and human health. Medicines for common conditions like diabetes and weight loss are profoundly affected by the time of day they are taken. Nearly every living thing on the planet, humans, plants, animals, fungi, and even single-celled photosynthetic bacteria has the amazing ability to track the course of the day-night cycle. Life on Earth could not exist without this ability to adjust its processes with the day-night cycle because this governs when cells grow, metabolize, reproduce, and so on, to take full advantage of peak times of solar energy and down times of total darkness. Now, plants are an obvious example. They photosynthesize and make carbohydrates during the day, and then at night, they metabolize the food they made earlier that day to grow new leaves, stems, and roots. And humans have basic processes that depend on whether we are awake or sleeping. At night, for instance, the body increases its output of growth hormones. This is when your skin cells regenerate, muscles repair damage, and children grow. When it is time for a wake-up call to prompt our body into action for another day's activities, our central master clock swings into action. This timekeeping computer is located inside a region of the brain called the hypothalamus. It consists of a small cluster of 20,000 neuron cells and is called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Not charismatic, chiasmatic. It is the headquarters that instructs a wide array of nerves and hormones to regulate many body functions over a 24 hour period. Other parts of our brain and many organs wait for a bugle call from the super chiasmatic nucleus to get the day started. And some of us are quicker at uh, waking up than others. So this central clock, body clock, is just one of many. Humans, mice, and various animals also have secondary or peripheral local clocks that run the different organs, tissues, and individual cells throughout their bodies. Just as a connected network of computers keep their time synced with a central server, the systems in our bodies keep their operations in perfect sync with the brain's central clock. In fact, almost every cell in the human body has a circadian clock. This enables each cell to figure out when to use energy, when to rest, when to make repairs, or when to divide and make more cells. By the way, this is the sciencey bit. We're nearly through it, and then it gets a little bit easier. I thought I'd get the hard bit done first. So, for example, human cells divide at a particular time every evening, which means our hair grows mostly at night. Wounds heal twice as fast during the day because skin cells for healing, or fibroblasts, turn off at night. The body, pineal gland, secretes the hormone melatonin at night to help us sleep and it stops around 7.30 a.m. when we're supposed to wake up. The stress hormone, cortisol, increases in the early morning to help us wake up. Lungs are most prepared to fight disease at the most active hours, and I could go on, the, the list is endless. And so, interestingly, what does all this mean for us? Circadian clocks are critical for good health. One of the most familiar examples is jet lag. If you fly from California to Virginia, you lose three hours in your normal schedule. So when your alarm clock says it's eight in the morning, the next morning, your circadian clock says that it's five o'clock still. Now eventually, your inbuilt circadian clock will adjust to the local time because of your amazing sensory and response systems in play. But as we, some of us know, who's been right to the other side of the world, it does, can take several days. But we do adjust back, and that is just incredible. We're programmed. This has been put into us. So God's design of humans is unique. Let's just look at us, us now, human beings. It tells us in 1 Corinthians, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. Here we can see that there, we're not all the same, that there is one kind of flesh of men and another flesh of animals. 
So this is saying that we did not evolve from animals. We're a different kind of flesh. God's design of humans is unique. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Only human beings were created to reflect God's creativity. We were created to be relational with one another and with him. But what we're going to really look at, as you'll notice through this, as a lot of creative people that you are listening, that human beings were created to reflect God's creativity, which is, which is endless. So this is true from the very first pair. Now, the presupposition that early humans were ape men or cavemen is incorrect. We're, you know, we seem to think that we started out as brutish, primitive, brainless, with large, hard features, where in fact we are from creative, civilized, clever, with diverse features from the very beginning. That picture on the right is a reconstruction of a Neanderthal man. So if he had a haircut and a bit of a shave, he would just look like us today. So how smart were the first human couple? They were very smart because Adam named all the animals, their children farmed animals and built a city, and they were alive when people used metals and played musical instruments. Now, playing a musical instrument has nothing to do with survival. It is showing creativity. And they, you know, they were still alive at that point. So from the very beginning, we have been creative. And more than just survival doing things for survival. Humans were placed above the animals. Then God said, let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. They were set apart from the beginning doesn't say after millions of years, once they'd evolved, they suddenly were in charge of the animal kingdom. They were set apart from the beginning to be different. So let's see how we differ. We have a unique upright skeleton. Humans are designed to stand and move on two legs, bipeds, whereas apes are mainly designed to climb trees and grip branches with all four limbs. So they're quadrupeds. An upright stature gives humans their unique mobility. And there you can see a number of um, features that is necessary for an upright skeleton. If you look, we need a flat face that so you can see and an upright skull, a straight back, upright hip joints, angled femur bone, da -da -da, upright knee joints, long legs, arched feet, strong big toes. Quite different to the skeletal um, structure of an ape on the left. The human body has at least 10 design features that enable upright standing and walking. Also, when the human knee, the, also the human knee locks when we walk upright, whereas chimps' knees don't. If you stand on one foot in your, and, and to balance, your knee will lock into position so you can stand there. Apes can't do that. They, their legs are always bent slightly. And if you try and stand like that for a long time, it's very, very tiring, which is why apes can only stand upright for very short periods of time. We have unique arched feet, incredible feet. The human foot is one of the most important design features required for an upright stature. The human foot has a unique arch structure, which allows us to push from the front and back of our foot and to stand on our toes. So when we run, if ever you go to start running, you probably won't even realize it, but you're pushing, you're, you're moving from your heel onto your toes and vice versa. We have three points of contact, giving us a perfect interface with the ground and perfect balance. A bit like, a, bit like a tripod, one, a camera on a tripod. Apes, however, are flat footed. They cannot feel the front and back of their feet, hence they can only stand on two feet for a short time before losing balance. So not only have they not got a locking knee joint, they now haven't got the right kind of feet either. Now, this is, we need to look at this before we go any further. This is very, very important. Irreducible design. 
Now, this is irreducible structures are a very important evidence for creation because they cannot evolve step by step. The features have to occur simultaneously. So the upright skeleton, the knee joint and the arch foot are all examples of this. So for example, if an ape-like creature had only some of the features needed for an upright stature, it would not be able to move properly on either two limbs or four. It's a bit like the mousetrap. If you haven't got all the bits, all the components in the mousetrap, at the same time, you're not gonna catch the mouse. So by the same token, if you've got a creature that is so-called evolving from an ape into a human, so, you, so it's half and half, it's got to have all those 10 features we showed you and more for an upright skeleton. It can't have a few of them and not, and, and a few not as they're changing. It just, it just, you just won't, just wouldn't work. They would die out. I hope I've made that quite clear because that's really, really important. So these independent systems are a prime example of irreducible complexity. The myriad complex components of the circadian clock system, which you looked at before, had to all be in place from the very beginning for it to work. You know, the one that wakes you up, the one that makes your skin heal things and, and all working together at the same time. It could not have evolved gradually. We have a unique brain. The human brain is the most intricately designed structure known to man. The brain receives and sends millions of pieces of information every second. Humans have a unique capacity for learning vast amounts of information, the ability to count to immense numbers, construct algebraic equations, develop theories, insights, and complex reasoning. Um, for the example, there's, the, there's, the, there's a chap who can actually um, relay, relate back um, 46,000, I think it's 46,000 digits from the pi, from pi, off by heart without even looking at it. The human brain shows that humans are designed to be both rational and endlessly creative beings. We have unique skillful hands. The human hand is one of the most sophisticated devices in nature, which man has failed to replicate due to its complexity. We have unique fully opposable thumbs, so each finger can make face-to-face -face contact with the tip of the thumb. If you try it, try each, thing, each of your fingers, you can do that. Apes cannot do this. Also, each finger can form a pinch grip with the thumb or a combined grip when more fingers are used. We hold a pen using two fingers and the thumb, which is like a tripod grip, very, very strong and sturdy. Human fingers have a unique full range of movement from a straight finger to a tightly curled finger. This enables us to write, draw, sew, do sign language, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Again, it's endless. Apes, on the other hand, have curled fingers designed for gripping branches. They cannot actually straighten their finger right out like we can. And 25% of the motor cortex of the human brain is dedicated to the muscles in the hands. This shows that humans are designed to perform complex tasks that are way beyond what is necessary for survival. And here's some just creative pictures that one artist did, He's a, I, uh, who, who took, I think it's about nine hours to do each one of these amazing paintings on hands of other people. We're pretty clever humans, aren't we? Thanks to being made in his image. I think that one's got to be my favourite because I like the way that the skin just even looks like elephant skin. <laughs> very, very clever. So we have unique facial expressions. Human beings can make up to 10,000 different expressions which are vital for communication and building relationships with each other. So much easier to, to talk to someone when, when you're looking at them face to face, isn't it? Although I'm pretty good on the phone. Um, humans have the whites of the eyes clearly visible, making it possible to see the direction of a person's gaze. This unique feature helps emphasize strong emotions like surprise and annoyance. You know, if you go and look in the mirror yourselves, because I can't do it to show you, um, 
and you're really scared, you know, your eyes will do, they will open wide, like, and, and you'll see it, you'll just see so much, and you'll read that, even if I don't, even if you don't say a word, you will know you're scared, or sad, or surprised by your eyes, they, they're incredible. There are about 50 separate muscles in the human face, about half of these are dedicated to making facial expressions. In contrast, apes have less than 30 facial muscles, with most of which are for non-communication tasks such as eating and closing the eyes. So again, if we evolve from apes, all this has got to be put into place instantly, kind of half and half. These are just silly pictures of what dogs would look like if you could see the whites of their eyes a bit more, just for a bit of fun, really. But this isn't funny, this part. This is a picture of one of the apes from Planet of the Apes, the original Planet of the Apes. And if you notice they, um, in these, they have got the whites of the eyes showing quite clearly, like a human being. And that's the one on the right is from the new Planet of the Apes, the most modern one. I'm sure most people have seen it. That is what apes' eyes are truly like. I know that's a chimpanzee, but it's the same for gorillas. Or oh, they are chimpanzees, aren't they, underneath? Yeah. So as you can see, their whites of the eyes are not showing. But it, it's the subliminal message to keep relentlessly putting into our children's minds and adults, because these films appeal to all ages, that we are evolved apes. Very, very clever and very, very dangerous. We have unique language and speech. Humans have the unique ability to communicate through intricate language. There are approximately 7,000 different languages used around the world. The human brain has areas dedicated to controlling language, such as thinking, hearing, speaking, reading, and writing. When people listen to speech, they hear gaps between words, even though the speech is continuous. So as I'm talking away to you about stopping, you are putting all those gaps in between each of my words. The human brain puts those gaps between words in the mind of the listener. Scientists have yet to understand how the brain does this. Now, humans have an amazing ability to learn and recall words. The number of words in the English language is greater than one million, and an average pers person knows about 20,000 words. Now, the next, next little fact I'm going to show you is the most important scientific fact you'll ever know ever hear of, and here it is. An average man speaks around 4,000 words a day, and an average woman speaks around 8,000 words a day. Now, the scientific explanation for this is that us women have to repeat ourselves because the, the men don't hear us the first time. So, moving on swiftly to other less important scientific facts. We have a unique childhood. Humans have a very long childhood of up to 18 years. In contrast, animals have a relatively short time to develop so that they can survive independently from their parents. One reason why humans have a long childhood is that they must learn uniquely complex tasks. We have a lot more to learn than an animal. Childhood also gives us time to mature emotionally in order to cope with the challenges of adult life, such as work, building friendships, marriage, and parenting. During the first five years of a child's life, the brain grows faster than any other part of the body and far exceeds any other animal. Now we have a unique information in the genetic code. About 95% of the genetic code is similar in apes and humans. Now this fact has been around for a long time, but now that they are discovering, I won't go into it in detail, but now that they are discovering that the junk DNA, meaning stuff we don't need, is not junk DNA, they're discovering there is a, it, everything has a purpose. Well, that's not a surprise, is it? But now the scientific world is discovering that, this 95% is deemed to be quite a bit lower. But let's go with the worst case scenario that they present that apes and humans have 95% of the same genetic code, similar. Now, the human genome contains about 3 billion units of information. 
This means that, that, that the 5% difference between humans and apes represents about 150 million units of information. So this is not a small genetic difference. Even if it's only 5%, which now, as I said earlier, it's not going to be, it's going to be a lot more. But even if it was only 5% difference, that represents 150 million units of information, making us different from apes. But the story doesn't end there because we 50% of the genetic code is similar in bananas and humans. So does that mean we evolved from bananas as well as from the apes? It's, it's ridiculous. And the only thing we could think of that we are the same is that perhaps bananas have got waterproof skin and maybe that little similar gene is, is used in humans and bananas, just as an example. 60% is similar in fruit flies and humans, 75% in mice and humans, 80% in cows and humans, and 90% in cats and humans. So the similarities are strong evidence of a common designer. So if God used something like cells that make the skin waterproof, for example, in a banana, he's going to think, oh, every animal I want to be waterproof will have that bit of genetic information in their code quite obvious. It's a bit like, let's put it like this, it's a bit like if I wanted to design a car, um, a brand new car, now what would I do? What have all these cars got in common? They've all got four wheels. They've all got a steering wheel. They've all got windows to look through and wing mirrors to help us navigate. Now, you could say I could start from scratch and decide to have three wheels <laughs> which was a disaster when it was done, wasn't it? Um, and try other things. But no, I would think this works, so I'm going to use it. That does not mean that one evolved from the other. It means that I'm using something that works in, a, in my design in others. And this is the same in the animal kingdom. Many animals have two eyes, two ears, four limbs, a heart, a brain, and 10 digits, whether it be fingers and toes, etc., or it's called something else. But those similarities are there because they work well, just like the four wheels works well on the car, these things work well in, in the mammals. So this is a Philippine, pin, Philipp, from the Philippines, a Philippine Tarsia, which is the smallest primate or in the world. It's quite cute looking really, isn't it? So, as I've said, a designer uses things that are successful more than once. Now, evolutionists call these patterns in nature homologies. So, if you open a typical biology book, you will probably find diagrams like these. You've got your human arm with the five digits. You've got a turtle with five digits, as for want of a better word. Um, the bat with five and a whale, all, they've all got this same sort of similar structure with a bone and another bone. According to evolutionists, these similarities are due to their being inherited from a common ancestor. As with all arguments for evolution, when we scratch beneath the surface, we find the argument collapses. So, for example, if we look at humans and frogs, they both have digits, agreed, or fingers, whatever you want to call them. If they have a common ancestor, their digits would grow in a similar way, yes? You wouldn't have them growing in different ways if they have a common ancestor. That's that's logical conclusion that we can make. So, digital development in humans and frogs, however, is very, very different. Humans start, as you can see on the in the picture on the left, with a spade-like structure and the digits develop through the material between them dissolving away and being removed. And then you're just left, you're left with the five fingers. A frog, however, their digits grow outwardly, so it starts and independently from buds. So it starts as like a fish shape and then they come out, grow outwards. The material is added and not removed. Two very different processes. This points again to a common creator, not a common ancestor, because he can decide how those things grow. 
if he wants one to grow outwardly and one to, to dissolve away, that's his decision. But it, 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 for it to evolve and one to evolve from another, from a common ancestor, it is not logical. We have unique marriage and birth. Now, marriage reflects the spiritual nature of humans and the special significance of sexual union between a man and a woman. The husband represents Christ and the wife represents the church. When Jesus was asked about marriage in Matthew, he referred back to Genesis 1 verse 27 and Genesis 2 verse 24, which shows that Christ accepted the creation account as a literal historical one. And he describes the sexual act in marriage as the two being reunited as one. This is an absolutely beautiful, amazing gift we've been given by God. So you start off with Adam. Eve was created out of Adam's side. So the one became Adam, became two, Adam and Eve. And when they are united in marriage and consummate that marriage and come together sexually, the two come back to being one. There is no other model. That is the model God gave. Women have the unique characteristic of having fertile periods throughout the year. This means that women can conceive and give birth at any time of the year. In contrast, most animals have a reproductive cycle where they give birth in spring so the offspring can develop enough strength to survive their first winter. The fact that animals have particular periods of fertility shows that the act of mating exists purely for procreation and is not carried out to create intimacy. So pandas have got the least time of fertility. Um, it's, it's only, oh gosh, I've forgotten, sorry. It's, um, I think it's 36 hours either once a year or once every two years. So if they don't mate in that time, they, they don't reproduce, which is why uh, I'm sure why pandas have been so endangered and humans have intervened and saved them a little bit. So unique spiritual beings. Humans have a unique capacity to worship. We each have a spirit to relate to God, a mind to think about and pray to God, and a voice to speak and sing praises to God. Animals do not worship anything. They were not made that way. We were created by God to distinguish between good and evil. We each have a unique immortal soul. Again, animals can't do that. They cannot distinguish between good and evil. Animals do not so how and when, sorry, animals do not have a unique immortal soul. And so how and when did these things develop in human beings? If we evolved from an ape without a unique immortal soul and a spirit, how did that come into human beings and when? How did that evolve in? We have a unique self-awareness. Humans have an awareness of self and rational thought that animals do not have. A dog, for example, would not wonder whether it was the best looked after dog in the world. It just lives in its own, own little world of being fed and looked after, etc., etc. Animals do not stop to admire amazing sunsets or spectacular scenery. They do not appreciate beauty, whether natural or man-made. They do not have a sense of what is beautiful, but God has made our planet beautiful for us to appreciate and enjoy. So God spoke it and it was done. It is illogical to conclude that God spoke and waited millions of years for his word to come to pass. And also, if you think about it, if at the beginning we saw that God called everything very good, if God had created evolution, some Christians actually believe that God created the process of evolution because, you know, it's, it, they want to... I try and understand and make the Bible fit the world. But unfortunately it doesn't because if God had created evolution, the process of evolution, and that we're at the human beings are at the end of that, it means that animals had to die out, um, had to live and die out, live and die out, live and die out before we got to Adam and Eve on day six. And so when God looked back at his world on day seven and said it was very good, 
if that had even been, if, if each day had represented millions of years, he'd be looking back at a, a creation full of bloodshed and death, which would not be very good. And wherever you put the millions of years for evolution to work, whether it be before day one, whether it be splitting up Genesis 1 in verse into two parts with a the gap theory, or whether you spread the millions of years out over the six days, making each day worth millions of years, whichever one you do of those, you have a problem. Because you're saying, like I've just said, that there was death and suffering, disease and bloodshed over millions of years before man existed, Adam, at the end of it. And there would have been disease because the fossil record shows um, uh, cancerous uh, problems in the fossil record and other diseases and deformities. And instead, at, as we know, the Bible tells us that, that in creation, after six days of creation, man, God rested, Adam and Eve sinned, they ate of the fruit, and because of Adam's action, death came into the world. Now, if, and then, sorry, who was the first Adam, and then Jesus Christ, being the second Adam, took the death away from us and to refer, redeemed us back to having an eternal life with him. So if there was death and suffering before Adam in our top model of evolution, which there had to be for you to evolve up, it means Adam, the first Adam, did not bring death into creation, into this world, and therefore we don't need the second Adam to take it away. So we've negated the gospel one easy swoop. Not only does it negate the gospel, it negates all these pivotal verses, very, very important verses that we're all, I'm sure, very familiar with. For the wages of sin, eating the fruit, is death. If, if the first model of evolution is true, that verse doesn't make any sense. The second verse in Romans 5.12, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin and in this way death came to all men because all sinned and then another man came and took it away like i've just said that verse is negated and hebrews 9 12 without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness that makes no sense either because we don't need to be forgiven if the sin wasn't brought in by adam but and that death all just came in by evolution and so we're near the end here. Jesus himself was a young earth creationist. In Mark 10, verse 6, we read, Jesus replied, but at the beginning of creation, God made the male and female. It doesn't say after millions of years and the slow processes. He says, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So a lot of people say, oh, well, the Old Testament, we can ignore that. But then if that's true, then Jesus is a liar. So evolution, based on millions of years, undermines the word of God and its timeline. Not only does it negate what Christ did on the cross, which we've seen with no need for a second Adam, but it also places doubt over what he has yet to do when he returns to earth and later creates the new heaven and new earth. How can the world be restored back to how it was, perfect, which is what the scriptures tell us will happen, how can the world be restored to how it was before the fall if there has always been death due to the evolutionary process before Adam's creation? And so we can see creation, as God the creator told it, is a very important part of our history. And thank you for listening. So this, as I said earlier, this talk was taken from our course, which is seven sessions. Please ask if you would like us to run a course near you or even a one-off talk, all free of charge. Or we even have a, a book if you wish to purchase that, um, if, you, you know, if you can't make any talks or, or want to know more without um, obligating yourself to a course. Okay, thank you ever so much for listening. I hope this has helped. Um, it's a lot to take in, I understand, but at least you can rerun the slideshow yourself and look at it and take in the reading, the words on, a little bit more slowly if you need to on some of the more complicated bits. Thank you very much. Bye bye, everyone.